in the lane, 15, 10, touchdown, Chargers! What's up, guys? Welcome into a brand new episode of Chargers Weekly, two weeks away from the NFL Draft, and as always, joined by Matt Money-Smith. Money, what is up, brother? Well, my apologies for the late post today. Uh, the NFL every year does a broadcast boot camp, and it's an opportunity for current and former players to learn the ropes of television, uh, play-by-play, radio, play-by-play, studio host, uh, slash analyst, podcast host, all that sort of stuff. So they always ask, since I'm in town, uh, it's easier for them to have me roll up there to do the radio play-by-play portion of it and so uh that's kind of what i was doing all day and and why everybody's nice. waiting around and so i appreciate you and greg and and all the folks listening and uh shout out to some former chargers that were there and uh always exciting to see them and, and talk football with isaac rochelle and the old mike and ike show remember that one and oh my uh gosh, do I? And chris harris uh jr as well so great to see a couple former chargers yeah my, mike and ike had a had a, a channel on the Chargers podcast network for a yes, year they did. Uh, doing some doing some fun stuff with players. Yes, but, they did. Uh, you know, I actually, you know, I was at the complex today. I interviewed Thule for uh, for an interview on Sports Central that's going to air later this month. And it was really neat to hear him talk about Ben Herbert and Harbaugh and getting another okay. year with uh, with Khalil and Joey and. You know, it was just a year ago, man, that this kid was, you know, USC player waiting for his yeah. uh, his name to be called. And now he's one of the cornerstones of this defense. So be on the lookout for that. And then I did something with Nick Hardwick uh, a few weeks ago that's going to air, too. And just just seeing Nick, I mean, you worked with the money in, in the booth. He's brilliant. It's, he's brilliant. And this is like his third act as a member of the Chargers organization. Obviously, player, broadcaster. Um, but just the passion shines through as a coach. And, and I know he's going to make this, this O line very nasty. No doubt. Uh, I'm looking forward to both of those uh, very much. So, and you know, you mentioned it, Chris, and, and I think, look, I, I know I take a lot of incoming for, for Tom Telesco stuff, but it's like, Hey, be fair. You know, if you're going to take shots for the fact that Quinton didn't perform as well as you might like in year one, and we're certainly hoping that he's going to bounce back here in year two, then, at least tip the cap that he's got Thule in, in round two, you know, and, and that's no someone, doubt. if you redraft, that guy's going top 25, I can promise you that. So I think a lot of times the, especially social media can be a, a sea of negativity. So, you know, don't forget there's some positives to come out of the draft last year. And there's a lot of teams out there that would love to have Thule on their defensive line, considering not only how good he rushes the passer, but his versatility to play inside and out and Khalil Mack ain't getting 17 plus sacks without Thule giving him at least five that he ran into because he was the one collapsing the opposite side so I'm looking forward to that I'm really looking forward to Thule <laughs> you know it's you think about I'll tell you what Chris I think about two and this is going to sound kind of weird so I, don't, I just hope it doesn't come out too weird but I think about two bodies on the Chargers just physical the way guys are built, the way their bodies are built. Yeah. And I think about Zion and I think about Thule and what what Ben Herbert, that canvas, those two canvases that Ben Herbert has to work with and just knowing how young they are, how strong they are and the fact that they don't, they still don't have man strength yet. You know, like that's still coming. That's still like a year or two away for, for Zion and like two to three years away for Thule to get that real man strength uh and i cannot wait to see how that how that you know progression kind of takes another step this year for each of them there's a picture of us at training camp next to Thule, and our legs look like oh, twigs it's humiliating it was, it's actually it, it it's looked photoshopped it looked photoshopped yeah, it's hey, humiliating. I, I i said that we had a couple of questions i, I just wanted to to kind of carry this over real quick because sure. it's it, it lines in with what we were just talking about uh from Jonathan Vang how many sacks do you think Bosa Mac and Thule will get this season let's just say that they're all healthy for 14 15 games um it could be scary I, I did mention to Thule that we kind of called him the the John Stockton of of sacks he kind of like sets other people up to get sacks so his he, he had to get four and a half last year but right. um boy like you said he he helped Khalil get uh his 17. The three of them, if they're all healthy for 17 games, I'll go 100. 
I'll go 100 sacks. <laughs> they all break the sack record. Yes. They, they will all, they, each of them, individually, one of them will break it, then the next one will break it. They'll each end up with 33 and a third. It's going to be incredible. There's a reason why they're paying those guys. Uh, even though Joey has had issues with injury, and even though Khalil is, you know, according to a lot of folks, past his prime, certainly didn't look like it last year in, in terms of production, but. There's a reason why they're still giving those guys tens of millions of dollars because they know if, in fact, they can keep them healthy, that teams just they can't deal with it. That's just that's yeah. the reality. When all three of them are on the field, they cannot deal with it. And to have a rotation where they can stay fresh, they just can't deal with it. So, you know, I, I think, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll draw this parallel, Chris, for, for all the folks that are Dodger fans out there you know, just kind of look at what they're doing with their rotation and think about that in terms of the defensive line, which is why I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, that's an early pick defensive line interior or an edge. Just, you know, you've got to keep these guys fresh. You've got to try to make sure they are there when the tournament shows up. And that's, you know, what you're seeing the Dodgers do with bullpen games. And when Walker Bueller comes back, it could end up being a six man rotation just because they want glass. Now they want Yamamoto. They want Bobby Miller and Clayton Kershaw to all be fresh when it's time to be fresh. And I think that's something you have to keep in mind when it comes to edge is the idea that you can roll these guys through, you know, who does the best job of it is Philadelphia. That's why they, they like look at oh, the yeah. way Philadelphia drafts and they just roll those guys through there, man. And it's just a never ending relentless pursuit of the quarterback. And it's why they're in the mix every year. Yeah. From, from uh, Fletcher Cox to Carter to the, the big Graham kid from, and was, Reddick uh, is it and it just Smith. No, yeah. It's nonstop. It's yeah. non, they draft O-line and D-line. And I think that's what you're going to start seeing this front office do a lot of is O-line, D-line, man, is where it's at. If you can be good at those two positions, you can really fill in around it and be very successful. Yeah, Tuli said also don't sleep on Morgan Fox this year too as, as a fourth edge rusher, you know, somebody who f- he feels like a hardball guy to me. Uh, hey, so Andy Bischoff, the, the run game coordinator and, and tight ends coach spoke at length about 10 minutes or so this week. And um, I, I always feel like there's an extension of Jim Harbaugh within all these coaches, right? Yeah. When when you hear Ben Herbert talk, you know that Jim Harbaugh is behind all of that. Um, and, and same thing with, with Coach Bischoff. And uh, you put a couple of uh, clips up on Twitter. Let's play a couple right now. This is just talking about the offensive line and what they mean inside the practice facility starting this year. Some people don't value offensive linemen. We do, okay? And that will be shown in how we approach everything from how we stretch to how we lift to how we run the ball to how we protect. Uh, This is a place where O-linemen are going to want to come and play because it's an O-line-centric space uh, where we're going to raise these guys up and make them feel great about what they do and what they have to offer and not push them to the side and make them the afterthought. They are at the forefront of our thinking. So, buddy, like we've been saying, you know, this is an offensive line centric football mm-hmm. team, but uh, Coach Bischoff took that to another level. Like it starts and ends with those guys, right? And you know, I don't know if I, I don't know if it's for you know if, if it's for dramatic purposes because I do think every team values offensive lines. Like, look, some teams don't. We do. Every team values offensive line. The difference is they don't commit the resources to it. I think that's that's the way you have to think about it. Is Are you going to put the not? Well, yeah, you're going to put the money. Are you going to put the draft stock? Are you going, is that, are you going to invest? Because that's the only way you can prove that you're different than everybody else is you will commit, pick in, pick out, contract in, contract out to ensure that the offensive line is, is top, top shelf. And, you know, you think about the teams that do that, Philadelphia, they in the playoffs every year. Dallas, you talk about their playoff failures, but are they in the playoffs every year? Like teams that San Francisco, Kansas City, like teams that invest in the offensive line, Baltimore, they tend to show up in the postseason. It's not, it's not a secret. And I'm not going to continue to, I'm not, I I know that we're going to, we're going to get to the draft and we're going to talk about the wide receivers. And, and I know people are tired 
at least they're letting me know that they're tired of me talking about it. And they, they I don't they, think so. Buddy, you know what? It's 50-50. And I think that, that means it's a great argument. I, I really do think there was a lot of people that say, hey, I agree with what Money's trying to say because they need more pieces. And then there's obviously people that, that think that there's a void as a number one weapon. But right. when, you have, when you have it split like that, that means it's a really good argument. I just keep what, you know, the reason why I keep bringing it up week after week after week is because this, this is the staff. This is the style of football they're going to play. I, I, I don't know why people are so resistant to accept that, why, why a number of people are resistant to accepting that. This is the way that, that, that Jim Harbaugh has played every single stop he has made, whether it was San Diego, Stanford, San Francisco, or Michigan. It was all the same. It is all physical, beat the snot out of you. If we got to win close games, we're going to win close games. And every now and then we got to cut it loose. And when, if we need to cut it loose, we're going to have the ability to cut it loose. But we'd prefer to play this way and to win this way. And we just saw two more coaches, Marcus Brady and Andy Bischoff. You just heard the clip. Basically, again, remind us of that. So all, all I'm doing is saying, read the tea leaves. You, you, you all wanted Harbaugh to be the higher and when you hired him, this is the staff that you hired. This is the football philosophy you hired. And this is a this is a general manager that he, you know, he was hired before Joe. And, you know, so this is someone that he's really comfortable working with and is going to have a very similar philosophy. And I just, you know, we, we ended up having two more coaches now say the exact same thing. And that is offensive line is priority number one. You know, an offensive. We had two offensive coaches say it. Even the passing game coordinator <laughs> was basically saying it. So that's all. Um, this is not me trying to be right. This is not me saying this is how I believe they should draft or what player I think they should draft. It's just me saying, hey, just I'm just reading the tea leaves. Yeah. Before we get to the draft, a couple more clips from Coach Bischoff. I I got fired up about the tight ends. I'm sure Chargers fans got fired up about Disley and, and Hayden Hurst when when. Uh, Coach Bischoff talked about him. Let's start with Will Disley first. I mean, when you start with Will, you're talking about one of the three guys in the league that can own the C-gap, period. And, and there's not many of them, okay? This is a different kind of football league we live in now, and to have a tight end that can own the C-gap is rare, and he's one of those guys. So, Money, owning the C-gap, I've mm -hmm. never heard it put so eloquently. And with enthusiasm, like, yeah. hey. You know, there's three guys now, uh, three guys in this league that can own the C gap. And he's one of them. Like just, Hey, we really scored here, guys. Yeah. Do you understand? We scored not our six guy guys, can... not seven guys, three guys, right? I, our guy can own the C gap. Do you realize how great this is? Can you believe this is happening? Can you believe yeah. we have this? Like, you know, it's, and, and again, just, just watch, watch how they play, you know, watch, watch, 6-0 line. I can't tell you how many games I called at Stanford. 6-0 linemen, two tight ends, quarterback, fullback, running back. Here we go. You know what we're doing. It's credit card alignment. You see where the strength is. It's power right, and you can't do anything about it. And, and we just got another 12 yards. So, yeah, that's that's value. You know, they, he's one of the first guys they sign in free agency. They, that, that's what they needed. They needed the, the tight end that can block. And I think for – look, I think this is a little bit different. Because I would have liked to have seen the Chargers have a competent blocking tight end the last three years. They haven't. They have not had a competent blocking tight end since Hunter Henry. They tried with Trey McKitty. That's what they tried to make him into out of Georgia. He wasn't it. And so I am excited that, that here's a staff that knows what they're looking for in that particular position. And they feel like they got it. He talked about Ben Mason, too. I know we're not going to play that clip, but he talked about him as a full F. You know, as as an F that can you know that can be that lead blocker that can find himself in the slot that can catch balls out of the backfield that can maybe play a little bit of tight end as well. But for the most part, he's just a straight fullback that's you know gonna gonna get after it. So yeah, that's it's, it's what they've signed. It's it, all the again keep saying it. All the signals are there. You can see what kind of team they're building. You can see what what they value and where they're placing priority. And I think. You know, I'll tell you, Chris, I think there, I think there's something, I think there is something to the idea that, that Jim Harbaugh just, he's so competitive and he loves football so much. The idea that he can go into Kansas city and bully that team. 
I, I think he's just so enamored with that idea. Like, oh, we're not going to just beat this team. We're going to go in there. We're going to punch them in the neck. Yeah. And we're going to put our foot on their neck, and we're not going to lift it. And they, they have no idea what's coming to town. And I just think he's – I just feel like the parallel is so – I'm going to say it again. It's second week in a row I've said it. I apologize. But I just feel like that parallel is so – so similar to what he wanted to do to Pete Carroll when he got the Stanford. It took him a little – now, remember, it took him a minute. It took him a couple years. But he, he had – and it's different in college. You can't go – you know, back then you couldn't. You know, it took him a couple years to build it, but that's what his vision was. Like, okay, you guys are going to throw it around and get your five-star quarterbacks and your fancy on the edges running backs and your wide receivers. Watch what I'm going to do. And I think there's something very similar to what he wants to do, you know, and what he, what he sees in the NFL right now and how people are playing offense. Bischoff mentioned that, that Disley can catch the ball, too. He, he's got hands. Yeah. Um, but this is what really impressed me. He, here's what he said about Hayden Hurst. You have a guy, Hayden. I mean, to me, you have six guys in the league that everybody wants, and you name the six. You go with Kittle. You say Waller. You name whoever you want. Everybody wants those six guys, okay? And there's no reason that Hayden can't be that next guy. You know, there's no reason. He's got all the speed, all the hands, all the ability. Hayden just needs to find the right situation. And we knew when we had him in 2019, that was the right situation for us. We couldn't control where it went from there, but we love the guy. And we're nothing but happy to have this guy here. And he will provide that athletic element to this offense that gives us an opportunity. So he mentions the top six guys and says Hayden Hurst could be in that company. And I tell you, he has the quarterback to get him the football, and we've seen Justin Herbert elevate so many different players. No reason to believe Hayden Hurst couldn't be a uh, a really good quality tight end with Justin Herbert throwing the, the football too. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, Chris. You know, you, I think people maybe forget. Like number one, he was the first round pick, right? So he's someone who evaluators believed could really play tight end in this league. There aren't a lot of tight ends that get drafted in the first round. Now, last year was a bit of an anomaly, but I, I think it's. Uh, actually, no, last year we just had one, right? It was just Dalton. And then everybody went in the second round, the Tucker Crafts and the Dalton Kincaids and Musgraves and all that. But um, but yeah, remember, he was drafted before Mark Andrews. And it just so happened that Mark Andrews and Lamar Jackson had this incredible connection right away. And it was clear that, oh, no, Mark Andrews is our guy. And I think that sort of, you know, relegated Hayden Hurst to the second you know, like just sort of the second option as far as pass catching went. He was a little bit more of the physical tight end, you know, whereas Andrews was more just that straight Kelsey-like, you know, brand. And, you know, he went down to Atlanta when they traded him and immediately put up his best year down there. He ended up with, I don't know, 50-plus catches, almost 600 yards, six touchdowns. So he certainly has shown that he can he can be that receiving tight end. He's got the athlete, like, like Coach Bischoff said, he's got the athleticism and the ability to be that. It was just sort of, you know, what he was asked to do in Baltimore and how Andrews just, you know, they didn't realize what they had or they would have drafted him first. And they were like, oh, okay, well, this this is what this yeah. guy's going to do. So you now have to kind of fill this lane. And clearly he was fine with it. Or else why would he re-sign with Greg Roman when he was the guy that put him in that box? Stone Smart's still in the room. Donald Parham's still in the room. Uh, I liked it. Uh, Bischoff said that, Clean slate for all those guys. It doesn't matter what you did last year, the year before. Different system, different coaches, clean slate. So maybe those guys could take a step uh, in this new regime, and, and maybe this system will suit them better. Who knows? Um, it also yeah, made and me I'll say about, this real quick, Chris, go ahead. is you know for the people that were thinking trade down, Brock Bowers. You know, uh, yeah, I was just going to say I, that. I'm like, oh, sorry. You know, I didn't mean no, to no, jump no. you and take it from you, but I think I think the signal is, no, they like their room. They, 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 they believe they have – you know, high level, they got a high level blocking first, receiving second tight end and a high level receiving first blocking second. And I don't mean as though they're deficient in the other category, but just that that's, that's what they've got. So I don't know why you would invest a first round pick and a tight end when you feel like you've got two really good tight ends, the way that, that coach is talking about Hayden Hurst and Will Disley. They, they probably for all the needs that this team has, that wouldn't necessarily fit what you would take in, in a first round pick unless he was graded so considerably higher than all those other positions that, that you would have available to you at, let's just say, if you trade back, pick eight, uh, nine, 11, wherever that may be. I was going to say like 10 minutes after that conversation, I said, okay, it doesn't sound like Brock Bowers 
is right. is potentially in the plans there if they think so highly of Disley and Hurst. And then, you know, maybe maybe Parham or or Stone Smart could get a little bit of a resurgence. So tight end, you never know though. Um we had a we had a lot of great fan questions last week, Money. Uh the draft is on everybody's mind. And like I said, a lot of discussion online after the pod. Uh good discussion, I thought, because Again, the I think it's almost like fifty five forty five, whatever whatever decision you want to take it in terms of do you take a wide receiver at five or do you trade out and get extra picks? So I thought it would be fun. First, let me ask you this question: How far do you think you would go back if you were the Chargers? What's like? What's your max? Well, for me, it's so much about the compensation, and I think it's I think that's what people. That, that what what folks that are listening that I I just I wish I had the answer I don't I I don't know what their board looks like how many first round grades do they have typically a team will have anywhere from fourteen to maybe max twenty two twenty three first round grades in any given gr- draft depending on how talented they feel like it is at the top so. Normally, you don't want to trade beyond a first round grade. You don't. You don't want to get out of that. And maybe you have in those first round grades. Maybe you have a tier of seven players that are blue chip players. You feel like are can't miss players. And and now you don't want to get out of that window because you want to. And and remember, when I say seven, they don't need a quarterback. So if four quarterbacks are going, seven would be pick eleven that you don't want to be back. You don't want to go beyond pick 11 because those are your seven blue stars um, or gold stars, whatever their, their color may be blue chip, gold star, you name it. They have them all. Uh, Every team is different in, in their, in their language that they use. So to me, that's, that's sort of what you've got to figure out. And then, you know, on top of that, it depends what kind of compensation are we talking about? Is it this year? Is it next year? Is it future years? And how do you want to build? Like, think about, think about the Cardinals and how they were able to maneuver it last year, where at the time you're like, wow, you're trading out a three and you're getting a first next year. Well, now look at them. You know, now look at what the Cardinals have and what they might be staring at to rebuild this roster that was pretty frisky last year, even though they lost a bunch of games, they were in a lot of them. So I think that's what it comes down to. Do you want capital this year because you really like this draft or could it be the Bears that give you number nine? And the only thing you get in addition to that is next year's one. And you would rather have that than a one and a two and a three or something along those lines. So I think so sure. much of that comes into play of what's what's a team willing to give up? Because uh, it certainly sounds like they're going to want a lot based on what the Harbaugh comments were at the owners meetings, right? That, that yeah, they view I, it as they could have the number one pick. I, I can't see them going past 11 because you have Denver and Vegas 12 and 13. And I think a, a trade with a division rival seems unlikely, especially because they're going to try to get a quarterback and it's probably going to be JJ McCarthy. And I'm not sure Jim is going to want JJ McCarthy mm. in the AFC West. That's my only reasoning for that. But I, I figured let's just go through. I, I, I thought DJ and Bucky, you had Bucky on, uh, on the believe pod this week, right? He was great. And yeah. he, he look, the great thing about Bucky if you want to, it's running on Bally's. They run the heck out of it if you want to watch it. Um, and then it's in pod form too. But the great thing about Bucky and one of the great reasons why we wanted to put him on is, you know, he's a coach. He's head coach at Granada Hills. Took yep. him to the state championship game last year without passing the ball, running the ball. And he said, I, I'm doing this because of Jim Harbaugh. I watched the way he played at Stanford and that was my motivation. I said, I can't get the kids that, these other schools in my conference are getting and in, in my league are getting. So how can I compete? And I realized, Oh, you know what? I'm going to do what Jim Harbaugh did at Stanford (laughs) and I'm going to bully him and I'm going to build up my O line and I'm going to make sure my kids are the toughest and we're going to play the most physical brand of football. And these other teams are going to have to figure out a way to scheme for us differently than every other game on their schedule. And it presented a problem for them. <laughs> he went on, he went undefeated until the state championship game. So let that be a lesson for the people that are asking, well, how can you can't have, not have a number one receiver? Bucky did not throw the ball in Southern California in high school football. 
He didn't throw it once in the postseason. They just ran the ball, and they went to the state championship game. So let that be a guide of how effective playing football when other people don't you know, play this style of football, how it could be. So it's really great, you know, and, and just to, to put a button on that, you know, his, his point was, I just, I can't envision a Jim Harbaugh team's first draft pick being a wide receiver. It just doesn't line up with how they, how they think and how they operate. He's, it's very hard for me to vi- visualize. Yeah, that makes sense. We'll take a wide receiver. So everything is predicated on the O line. Everything that they do is, is built off of offensive line play. So they DJ and Bucky did a quarterback scenarios pod that I listened to it was really good and kind of laid out what they think some of the teams that are selecting quarterbacks may do and kind of how they're thinking. And I, I thought if you, if you kind of put it from a Chargers perspective, the top eleven, there's there's going to be movement all around the Chargers, which may dictate what they do at five. Uh, if somebody trades up with New England. If the Cardinals make a trade with Minnesota or somebody uh, where Jaden Daniels goes, because maybe if Jaden Daniels goes to Washington, Vegas isn't going to try to trade up. But if Drake may goes to Washington, maybe Vegas tries to get the three because Antonio Pierce, you know, recruited Jaden Daniels and and wants him in silver and black. Um, Another thing I thought about this week, I, I looked at Justin Herbert's completions this past season, and I think he had 297 completions. 197 of them are out the door. Like no Keenan, no right. Mike, no Gerald, no Austin. So if the Chargers did not stick and pick at five and take a neighbors or Harrison, who you would naturally just assume would be the number one option in an offense. Or a Dunze. Uh, Can't let you leave him out. Or a Dunze. Yeah. I, I, I'm almost thinking too that let's say Chicago wants – to get Marvin Harrison at five and right. you flop with that. I mean. Maybe, a, maybe a Dunze's there at nine, you know, could be. like he Most could definitely. be. Um, so would you be comfortable going into this season with Joshua Palmer, Quentin Johnson as the number one weapon or a Will Disley or a Hayden Hurst, because that's what it would essentially be. Or it would be a guy in the back half of the first round um, that you take a flyer on or the second round. And, you know, for every AJ Brown and, Puka Naku and Cooper Cup, there's a Nikhil Harry and Jalen Rager and Laquan sure. Treadwell, you know? So it's sure. it's almost like you take the guesswork out of it if you pick a guy at five. So that's that's where I go back and forth about what they may do because two quality wide receivers did leave. And I know that it's not necessarily the way Jim wants to play, um, but you do have to have talent on the outside to win in the NFL. Like the Chiefs have Travis right. Kelsey and – you know, Rasheed Rice came came second alive, rounder. I think, for them. Second round pick. You just got to make sure you hit on that second round pick, I guess. Right. Nico Collins, third rounder. Tank Dell, second rounder. They just traded a fourth for Stephon Diggs. Don't forget about the the secondary free agent market that's coming. After the draft, when teams assess or figure out who's available to them on their best, if they're a best player available team, now all of a sudden they've got wide receivers they're bringing in. They're going to cut guys that cost a lot more because now they can be more cost effective and those players are going to be available. Who knows what happens with Tyler Boyd, T Higgins. And again, this all plays into the compensatory selection process. Remember after the draft, it's different. Now you don't have to worry about giving up selections in the compensatory formula. That's the first wave of free agency where all that stuff comes into play. So there's still free agents and teams that'll be dusting guys after the draft post June one cuts that could end up on this team at the wide receiver position. So in terms of wide receivers, the one thing that has changed. So, and and this is, this is a product of my years of doing fantasy football for the NFL network. The the old adage, when, when we would do our draft shows going into the season, like one of Michael Fabiano's like, pillars of his football fantasy football philosophy was no first round wide receivers it takes them a year to two to get going you, they just they don't they aren't ready in their rookie year it's so rare to get that out to get that big rookie see that has changed so dramatically because yeah, football has changed so dramatically with the the emergence of friday night lights and seven on seven 
and kids just playing receiver, the best athletes playing receiver, it's all changed so much that there's, don't think of it as, like I, I, I look at it and I say, don't just think of it as we got to get one of these three guys. You don't know how close the grades are on these other. It, it, you may think that they're okay. If they're in this tier and I'm if for those of you watching on YouTube, I've got my hand up here. Let's say this is where those three are. Well, maybe the next tier of Lad McConkey and Ricky Pearsall and Brian Thomas. And that, maybe it's right here. Maybe it's pretty close. And they're like, well, we have an elite quarterback, an incredibly elite quarterback. So it's different putting Ricky Pearsall or Lad McConkey on the Chargers than it is in Carolina because Justin Herbert's throwing him the ball. So now all of a sudden his evaluation is raised and yeah. he's got a chance to be a number one. And these, and, and you look at what CJ Stroud did for Nico Collins, that Davis Mills couldn't, we weren't talking about Nico Collins as a number one receiver in this league. Now the guy's a freak show because he's got, a freak show of a quarterback throwing him the football. Like Nico Collins is in the elite receiver category now because of how big, how strong, how good he is with contested catches, how fast, his yak. And that was a third round guy. Yeah. So it's important to remember that the quarterback comes into play when evaluating wide receivers and who's throwing him the football as opposed to just we're dropping Marvin Harrison or Roma Dunze or Malik Neighbors in here. I can't wait to see what it looks like with Justin Herbert throwing the ball. So I think that's something that they're probably factoring in as, as well. Yeah. Um, let's go through the, the first 11, right? Chicago with number one, Caleb Williams. There's no discussion right. at this point, right? Washington. I don't think they'll trade out. I think that they need to get their quarterback in the future. I just look at their roster. They, right. they, like they're drafting a quarterback. Oh, yeah. drafting you know, a quarterback. New England's different because they have Jacoby Brissett, who's a very capable starter in this league and is could easily give you one or two, maybe two, maybe three years as a viable if you build up the defense and have a sound offensive line running game. Yeah, like I can win you games. So that is not Washington. They, they traded Sam Howell. They, they, they need a quarter. Marcus Mariota ain't starting games for them. They, they're, exactly. they're drafting a quarterback. There's another thing that, that DJ brought up. There's a difference between a bridge quarterback and a backup quarterback. Mariota at this point is a backup quarterback. Yeah, like that's he, a great point. That, exactly that guy, right. that guy that they're drafting it to is going to start. It, yeah. it probably will be Jaden Daniels. I feel like he he makes a lot of sense for what they want to do. Cliff Kingsbury. If it's not, this is where it gets interesting, and this is how it affects the Chargers, I, I think. Uh, what does New England do? Do they stick and pick, or do they accrue a ton of capital and try to rebuild their roster, especially offensively. They got some pieces on defense, but offense was just a nightmare. The quarterback play was a nightmare. So if, if you're really high on a guy like Daniels or May, you could just stick and pick. But let's say the the commanders take Drake May instead of Jaden Daniels. That's where, you know, Minnesota, Vegas, um, I don't know if Denver would move up, um, but like New England has a market now for that number three pick and depending on who the quarterback is, man, like that could really shake up the draft before we even get to Arizona at four money. And it all just comes down to what their evaluation is of the quarterbacks. So it feels like a lot of people don't like Drake may in the, in the media that he's sliding a, a little bit. I have no idea what Elliot Wolf and Gerard Mayo and, and, and Robert Kraft and how they view this particular collection of quarterbacks and then you have to factor in what is next year's quarterback class look like? What kind of season do we think we're going to put together? We've got to get a quarterback of the future at some point. It wasn't Mac Jones. You tried to draft one in the first round. He's now in, in Jacksonville. It's not Bailey Zappi. So Jacoby Brissett's great. He can start games for you, like I said, for this year, next year. But at some point, you're going to have to address that position. So for them, it's just a matter of what's the evaluation. Is it – do they – do they view Drake May as a potential franchise quarterback? Jaden Daniels as a potential franchise quarterback? J.J. McCarthy as a potential franchise quarterback? Or for that matter, Michael Penitz or Bo Nix? And can they trade back, get a haul, and feel better about their pick? Because they like Bo, they, they've got Bo Nix or Michael Penix or J.J. McCarthy rated higher than Drake May or Jaden Daniels. And they're totally fine moving back to a spot where they can get them. The one thing I'll, I'll say about about quarterbacks and this is something I've 
in covering the draft for NFL Network forever, I would always hear over and over and over again, when you are in the market for a quarterback, you do not get cute. You don't say, well, you know what? We like McCarthy more. So if we trade back with the Giants to number six, we can you get, get him your the- guy. You get your guy. It doesn't matter if you get him at three. Look, you don't like maybe you don't like Daniel Jones, and I can understand why you wouldn't, uh, folks listening and watching. But the Giants weren't messing around. Like, we're taking our guy. Well, they could have got it. Why'd they take him at six? They could have got him at 13 because he was their guy. And they did not want to risk it. So and they doubled down and paid him. Yeah. So that's the thing. Like that when if they have a guy, whoever it may be, I don't think they're gonna get cute. If it's J.J. McCarthy, they're taking him at three. If it's Bo Nix or Michael Penix, they're not going to trade back far. They are not going to play around. So that's that's the one thing. And they look like a team that is interested in drafting a quarterback. I just don't know if they like any of the guys outside of Caleb Williams. So if, if Williams, Daniels, or May in some order go top three, Four is Arizona, and and this is where maybe the Vikings or somebody tries to move up and gets J.J. McCarthy, maybe before the Chargers. But if they don't, and you laid out that scenario with the Cardinals last week, the only caveat I'd give to that is if they want to get cute and trade out of four and they want to get back in and and get Marvin Harrison, guess what? I'm going to put a Marvin Harrison tax on you, and you're going to give me an extra third, right? Like if you want them that bad, we love them too. Right. So like if, if you right. want to come back, you got to give us an extra third because you got them. You got the ammunition. So uh, th- that's that's where I think, OK, J.J. McCarthy territory. And that's also Marvin Harrison Jr. territory. I, I don't think that uh, it's just quarterbacks in, in terms of teams that would trade up to get somebody. I think Marvin Harrison Jr. is that type of player that other teams would be interested in maybe trading up for. I would imagine that and I think I saw because I got tagged on a bunch of of the the tweets but there was someone in Arizona that that shared this scenario that we were talking about and he shared it in a manner that like hey this is being discussed I didn't mm-hmm. go there I just say this this seems to line up it makes sense right why would you not trade out a four if Minnesota wants to give up 11 and 23 and you already have 27 and then you can just trade 11 and 27 to the Chargers and go back and get the same guy you were going to draft anyway it just makes perfect sense because 11 and 27 that's a premium that the Chargers are getting for the fifth pick. That's it's about an extra 300 plus. It's like 350 plus points on the chart. So you're essentially getting a high third rounder for for as a premium for them coming back up if you get picks 11 and 27. So I saw all these people. You can't let the Cardinals do you like that. Tell them no way and that and force Minnesota to trade with you instead and force them to stay there and and pick. And like, you got to remember, like these, th- th- this isn't about spite. It isn't about who's, who's getting one <laughs> over on another. They're just individually weighing what is the fifth pick worse, worth and what are picks 11 and 27 worth? Or what are picks 11, 36, and 71 worth? Like combined, how much value is in that versus keeping pick five? So that's how they, they don't care if everybody wants to celebrate you know, awesome Ford for what he did again. Oh my God, he's a master. He doesn't care about that. It's just worry about us. How often do you hear coaches say that we're, we're worried about us. They, 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 you can worry about them and talk about what about what they did here and how they signed this guy there. All we got to do is build our team. And if they feel like they're going to get a quality player at 11 and 27, that is of more value than the one player they would get at five, they're going to do it. Or if they want in that scenario, if they want 11, 30, 36 and or thir- yeah, they've been 11, 36, and they have three threes. I believe they've got their, they've got like their own, and one's at like 71 they and one's like, at 90. They got like six picks on the top yeah. of 100 or something crazy. Exactly. So there's any way for them to put it together to try to fill the holes on this roster. They have a lot. I don't think people realize how many holes they have to fill that, you know, they need a linebacker, they need an off ball linebacker. They need a big body in the middle of this defensive line. They need a legitimate defensive tackle. They need, they need depth on the offensive line. They need a wide receiver. They need corners. They like, there's a lot in drafting a wide receiver at five. So here's the, here's the case for drafting the wide receiver at five. If your evaluation is gold star, 
Hall of this is the best yes evaluation we have had on a player that's available to us in X number of years. How do you pass up on that? I think that's I know you want to play this way and but but hear me out. We can we can figure it out. We'll we'll find O Lyman. We'll find D Lyman. We're gonna God knows, coach at Michigan, you did it with three stars. You didn't do it with with five star blue chip Ohio State style recruiting classes. You you are good coaches. You're able to develop these guys. I'm telling you, I'm gonna get someone that we have. This is the highest rating I've put on a wide receiver since Jamar Chase. Since the, the Marvin Harrison is a legitimate X bust you up. You better commit two bodies to him on every single snap. Like that's possible that 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 could end up being the conversation. But I don't yeah. know if it is. Yeah. So I, you know, there's, it's not, it's not foolproof. It's not. It's not. Certain. It's not. There's nothing the, certain about this. It never, never in the draft. That's yeah. that's the biggest thing. There's been so many misses in the top five, ten quarterbacks, other right. position groups. Doesn't matter. Um, but the further you get away from one, the more of a guess and gamble I think it is. So if if you're at five and it's Harrison or neighbors, and you believe that this is the safest bet you could possibly have, and you give this this number one weapon to your your quarterback who's making a ton of money, and this guy's going to be on a rookie deal for five years, it's like, okay, we, we could still play this way. We could still be physical and run the football, but it doesn't hurt to give our quarterback, you know, a generational weapon. And and that's, I guess that would be the conversation of five money. Like if, if they're forced to pick, can you envision them taking anything else other than Harrison or neighbors? So here's, I don't think they're going to be forced to pick. I think they're either going to say we're sticking because we got to take this person. We got to take this player. The, the evaluation is too high. The gap's too force big. Is the wrong, force isn't the wrong no, one. If think, they decide, no, I know what you're if saying. they decide to pick. Yeah. Yeah. I, to me, it's they're, they're sticking and, and they're going to pick the best player available. And to me, that's who knows? Maybe it is Joe Alt. Maybe, maybe he's got a higher grade. So this is, I hope this analogy works. This is the way I would describe it. If in fact they're going to play football the way I think they're going to play it. Imagine you have two options. Someone has come, you're, you've got a nice kitchen. You cook every night. You cook three, you don't like going to restaurants. You cook your meals at home, but your oven's not great. It, it takes a little bit extra long. You don't have the nicest, you know, you don't have a great microwave. You don't have great cookware. So your meals are good, but they're not great. And you've got someone that says, hey, I can come in. You use this thing every day, three meals a day, and I am going to make just this incredible rest five star restaurant level kitchen for you to cook in every day. However, for the same amount of money, there is a hell of a vacation property down on the beach in Cabo. You've got an ocean view and you've got a, an infinity pool. Now, you're not going to use it a lot You're because you've got to work. You're only going to be able to go there three weeks a year. But you are going to have one of the most beautiful properties in Cabo that anybody in town has got. But you're only going to use it three weeks a year. Or I'm going to take that money and I'm going to redo your kitchen and you're going to use it three times a day every single day. So Malik Neighbors is a timeshare. He's a timeshare. Yes. Is that what you're saying? To me, like, <laughs> exactly. The way that they're playing football, he's three weeks vacation. The, the O-line, the D-line – corners like they're every they're three meals a day that's just that's the way they play it and the idea to have neighbors or a dunze or harrison is hey you know what we're gonna we're gonna need you justin we need you in this jj it's alabama now okay they got up on us it's a tight game we we've managed to hold them down defense is playing great we've created some turnovers but we need you to get out there and make a play now because we're trailing and it's it's JJ McCarthy time. It's winning time. And I know you got it in you. And he went out and he made the plays. Yeah. And he had to. And that's what Jim Harbaugh was talking about. This guy's a winner. And he sacrificed for the team. And what's good for the hive is good for the bee. And we ran it 32 straight times against Penn State because that's how we wanted to win. But when we needed him, we called on JJ and he won us the game. And I think that's maybe how you have to sort of visualize Justin Herbert. 
you know, and, and that's, Hey, Justin, and that's what, that's what Andy Bischoff said, right? That's what he said in his presser. Yep. We got to take something off this guy's plate, man. You cannot put the weight of the world on him, snap in and snap out. And you've got to throw it every time. And you've got to do the checks and you've got to no. Hey man, kick back, relax. Let's run the ball. Let's play physical. Let's push these guys around. Let's have a 14 play eight minute drive against the chiefs and go up seven, nothing. And now our defense with Byron Murphy that we took with the 11th pick in the middle of the defensive line and Thule and Joey and Khalil Mack is going to be firing off the ball on every single snap, you know, and, and, and like, that's, it's just, fa it's fascinating, man. It's fascinating what they can do. Because we don't know what five. they're going to do. We don't know what How they're going to play. Do. We haven't seen it. Because, you know, you, you could throw a little bubble screen of a league neighbor and he could take it to the house. Like, he's that explosive. Like, you, yeah. you could still play that type of ball, but have somebody that you have to account for on the outside at all times and play action. And, you know, it, it makes the running game even more deadly, in my opinion, if you have somebody like that on the outside. Yeah. So it's, man, it's just, it could go it works either both way ways. at five. It works both ways at five. Um, six is another interesting spot because I think the Giants are probably in the Malik neighbors, Marvin Harrison market, but also maybe poking around a quarterback. And do they trade up? Do they trade up a couple of picks? Like you said, if, if they want JJ McCarthy and they don't think they can get him at six, do they kind of leapfrog the Chargers and, or, you know, ma making sure that the Vikings don't get them? Um, so, like you have the Cardinals on one side, you have the Giants on the other, and you're trying to like visualize like who are they going to take? Like the Cardinals could go in a variety of directions. The Giants they took Evan Neal, they took Andrew Thomas in the past over the past few years. Um, do they take it feels another like tackle? Wide receiver. It does feel like wide receiver, doesn't it? If it's not Malik, quarterback, it's wide receiver. Did you hear Malik Neighbors it's... talking about? Uh, he goes, "Yeah, they just got to get that quarterback situation figured out up there in New York." Oops. <laughs> So we don't know. We, we'll, we'll see. Uh, we'll see if Malik uh, ends up going to New York. But uh, at, yeah. at seven, it's it's Tennessee, and I, I'm looking at potential trade partners and what certain teams may do. Would do they? Would they stick and pick? Tennessee needs offensive linemen, and yeah. you could probably get all at seven potentially. Yeah, or you know, again, it's a deep offensive tackle class so Pick maybe it's not their number one it could be latham it, it could be fuaga it could be fatanu it could be amarius mims and even though he's only got eight starts they love those eight starts so that's they spent 92 million bucks on calvin ridley they drafted uh Traylon burks in the first round two years ago they they paid tony pollard like they they drafted will levis they believe in him so to me it's you better build that old lineup that's and that's kind of what we're talking about right with it's like, yeah, great. You've got all these things, but you can't block for S. So you're not going to get to use them. Tony Pollard's not going to be able to run through any lanes because they're not open. And you got no time to throw the ball to Calvin Ridley because you can't block the edges. So what does it matter? What, what, yeah, what does it matter get that you have these weapons? So that's, that's, that, that seems to be like the consensus is that's an offensive, that's an offensive line pick right there, guaranteed. At eight, Atlanta – Took care of the quarterback with Kirk Cousins. You drafted Kyle Pitts, so no Brock Bowers. You, you drafted Drake London, so no Roma Dunze, let's say. This may be maybe first defensive player off the board territory or offensive lineman. I could see both. Could be. I'm just going to their I'm going to their depth. There are lads right now. Uh Jake Matthews getting a little old in year 10 at left tackle. Uh they obviously they've in, they have always invested in O-line heavily. So that's an interesting one there. How much time do they believe they have in Jake Matthews? With Jake Matthews, he's still pretty darn good. They got the receivers in Drake London. They signed Darnell Mooney. They traded for Rondale Moore. We obviously know Bijan is a stud. Their tight ends, Kyle Pitts. Even Warner was pretty darn good uh, as a blocking tight end. So good there. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I think you start looking at the edges, and, and that makes sense. Maybe it's Dallas Turner. Maybe it's Jared Verse. Uh, or you know, could be a corner. Certainly could be corner. A.J. Terrell's damn good. They drafted him in the first round. But they could use a second. You can always use corners. So that could be the number one corner if they really like Terry and Arnold or Quinion Mitchell. But, yeah, that to me looks like it'll be defensive side of the ball. Then at nine, uh, the Bears 
they could stick or if they really wanted to just give Caleb Williams just a, a plethora of weapons, you get I mean, DJ much, Moore, yeah, Keenan Allen. I guess the qu- question is how much time do you think Keenan has left? Yeah. And it's it's, it's Keenan there year, for a year. Can, yeah. yeah. Is it one year? Then okay. Then then wide receiver makes sense if a Dunes is sitting there. But they need help. They need another end. They So if Dallas Turner or Jared Verse are sitting there, they got to pair somebody with Montez Sweater. They're just going to gang up on him. With, with tight ends and backs to, to try to neutralize him. They could use, you know, that, that to me, that makes sense. It's like, it's not all about, I know you want Caleb to have the best possible introduction, but man, he's got solid O line. He's got DeAndre Swift and he's got Cole Komet, who's a damn good tight end. He's got DJ Moore, who is a legit number one receiver. And if he's your number one, Keenan's in the conversation is one of the best number twos in the league. So he's got Gerald Everett. See, <laughs> yeah, he's got Gerald Everett as a second tight end, like pretty good there. Swift they're, they're, in the backfield, pretty, pretty well covered. Yeah, uh, ten would be the Jets, and this could be Brock Bowers' territory. They could go offensive lineman. They could pick I mean, their that's tackle. The thing. Everybody's like, right? oh, Brock Bowers, Brock Bowers. I'm like, do you guys not realize that got their old line is terrible? Yeah. Like that, uh, Aaron <laughs> Rodgers is forty and has a blown Achilles. Yeah, and Tyron Smith. Is, this is a one year one year project for Tyron Smith. I mean, I know, yeah, they signed Tyron Smith. They signed Morgan Moses. They're both great. If they're healthy, they're really, really good. But, man, guys get hurt, and and I appreciate that they invest. And that's, I guess, where the thinking with Bowers comes in is they sign Mike Williams, perennially hurt. They've got Garrett Wilson, legitimate number one. Brees Hall, legit elite running back. I get all of that. And maybe this is where the whole Andy Bischoff conversation comes in, right? The, uh, you know, we care about O-line. Well, if you do, then invest in it. Put a draft pick on it, Jets. You've got elite tackles available to you. You know, the, all the names we just mentioned, take your pick. It could be Alt, it could be Fuaga, Latham, it, you know, whatever. They go ahead and get Brock Bowers. It's like, oof. Now they need a tight end. So totally possible. And look, and I, and I'm a, you look, we've talked about Brock Bowers enough. You know, I love the guy. I think he's a freaking stud and is going to be a stud in this league. But, you know, Aaron Rodgers is 40. He's got a busted Achilles. The idea that you're going to take he doesn't like rookies. Chances. He doesn't like rookies anyway, right? Yeah. He historically doesn't like throwing to rookies. Right? So, yeah. Heck, he made him sign Randall Cobb and Alan Lazard, who were god-awful last year. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Lazard was terrible last, terrible last year. So, yeah. But, yeah, I could see Brock Bowers because he's that good. He's that good of a player. He's going to be – don't let the stupid photos fool you. Rob Gronkowski's a freak, complete freak of nature. So, Brock Bowers is going to be a really, really good tight end in this league. Really good weapon, I should say. He's more of an offensive weapon than anything else. Finally, 11. This is where we, we think the Chargers could probably – it's probably the most likely scenario, right? The, the Vikings move up. It's pretty clean. Um, yeah, it, it's pretty clean. And at 11, you could miss out on a Dunze, but this is where you could pick your tackle. You could pick your corner. You could pick your edge. Uh, th- there's a lot of options here. And then if you have 27 too, who's to say money? Like, listen, I know that you need as many bodies as possible, but if, if somebody like Fuaga, like, starts slipping a little bit just because of the, there's a run on somebody and it's, you know, 18, 19, and you want to move up seven or eight spots. Like who's to say you don't flip a third, a future third, or, a, a you know, a, a pick this year to get the guy that you want. So I, I look at 11 and 27 as, okay, yeah, you take best player available at 11, 27, you know, I'm not married to kind of sticking and picking at 27. Like if, if you see a guy who's, kind of slipping down the draft board and you have a first round grade on them, you know, do what you can to get them. Right. You know, it's look, the team, the, the, the team is more than a wide receiver away. I think that's the most important thing to remember. They need, they've got a lot of needs. And so it's not just what they do at five or if they trade back, it's not just what they pick at 11. It's they need to hit in this draft. They need to hit their second rounder. They need to hit their third rounder. Those are your money picks. 
man, those are starters on most teams. You know, you got to get a, a Tuli Tui Pelotu in, in the second round. You've got to hit on these guys. And so, so many people are focused on five. And I think it's, it's more, okay, what can we get at 37? What is, is there still, are we still in the, the, the corner game? Are we still in a starting corner position? What kind of linebacker might be available? How good it was, you know, of a, of a, of a linebacker might be available at 37. Cause we need to add to that room. Like yeah. it goes, everybody is so focused on the first round pick without realizing the best pick that the chargers had last year was a second and a fourth. You know, their fourth rounder was an all pro returner and their second rounder was one of the best rookie defensive linemen in the, in the entire draft class. So don't, don't get too singularly focused on five, start looking through this draft and think about where are we getting corners? Where's the linebacker coming from? Where's they need D linemen. They, they need, they need a center. It's a lot of holes. They need, they need guards. They need tackles. Like there's, there's a lot that this team needs. So it's, that's why to me, the trade down, if, if you can add start, you know, when, when so, you know, what were you talking about? Like you were talking about the safety idea of it, right? If you pick it five, that's the safe pick, right? Like, hey, this is the highest grade we have. Okay, but what if you get a two and a three? If instead of the two or, or you get the two, one, well, now I got two bites at the apple. Now I got two shots at getting a starter. Or now maybe I have three shots. Can I get two starters out of my three picks? And now that's kind of how you start to build this roster out. Yeah. Um, so that's, that, that's, that's why there's so many different ways they can skin it. And it's, it's not just necessarily taking one blue chip player because you don't want to run the risk or let's not run the risk and take three bites at the apple. And that way we got a better shot at one of them because God knows, you know, just, just look at the Rams, look at what they've been able to do with twos and threes and fours and fives and Kyron Williams and Puka Nakua and Cooper cup. And like they have hit, that is how they didn't go from being what I thought was a team that was going to tank and one of the, one of the worst most inexperienced rosters in the league last year to the playoffs and damn near a playoff win because they hit on their picks, yeah. those middle round picks, you know? And so that's, they got to hit on the running back in the got to hit round. on the running back. I was going to say, you know, that's like, like Isaiah Spiller was a pick that, you know, Joshua Kelly, fourth rounder, Isaiah right. Spiller, fourth rounder. We didn't get anything out of him. JT no. Woods hasn't got, haven't gotten anything out of him. Um, right. Those are thirds and fourths. You've got to hit on those. They have to start. They have to start in this league. And, and right. you know, running back is another position. I was listening to, to the athletic pod with Dane Brugler this week. And they were talking about, you know, Corum and um, Allen. And, and, and Dane says something very interesting. He said that, you know, in talking to everybody around the league, um, the, the order of how teams have running backs is all over the board. Like Blake Corum could be the second – running back off the board in one team's eyes and the seventh in another team's eyes. That's yeah. how it is. That's how I, the beholder it is. So it's really about fit and finding the guy that's going to make the most sense for this offense. And you can't afford not to hit on him. Um, and, you know, maybe this is the year that we do see something at Isaiah Spiller. I don't know. We, we, we didn't see him right. in a game hardly at all over, over two years. So maybe he gets some run. Who knows? Or maybe they're just waiting for post draft, so there's no compensatory pick attached to it, and it's J.K. Dobbins, and they're just waiting. Like, hey man, we got you. Here's what the number's going to be if you're good with it. Wait till after the draft, when the compensatory pick goes out the window, and we'll sign you. And maybe that's what they'll do. Like that's that's the whole thing. Is there's still going to be a ton of free agents available that you can try to build depth and stock this roster with players that fit the philosophy that you want to operate under, but. Just to reiterate that point, as, as you know, you kind of built on it there, Chris. Yeah, they they need they need starters. They they need to they need to do what Baltimore did in the third round with their defensive interior, you know, their interior linemen on defense. Like Matt BK was a third rounder. That's the kind of that's the kind of hit they need. Uh it's a Kobe Turner for the Rams. Yep. Like young turn like think about it. those are second young is a second rounder or a third rounder turner was a third rounder kyron williams was a fifth rounder like dude there avila was a second rounder like you got to hit on those guys that's what you got to hit on 
That's and that's really where a lot like look here. Look at this. I'm going to go through it for you want to talk about here's what you're contending with. Chiefs, Mike Dana was a fifth, Derek Nottie, a third, Chris Jones, a second. We know Karloftis was a first, Nick Bolton, second, Nick Chanel, third. You know, Trent McDuffie was the 25th pick in, in the draft. Like, they hit on all those defensive picks, and it wasn't just ones. It was twos, threes, fours, and fives yeah. that they were able to hit on that that basically saved them. You know, that that's... That, that that's how they won the Super Bowl last they year. They rode the, the defense offense was year. not humming. Yeah. It was the defense. And you know what? Like the fact that they got Creed Humphrey in the second, Trey Smith in the sixth, that's what saved them. Their tackles were terrible last year. Donovan Smith was okay, but Orlando, um why am I Orlando Brown. blanking on Zeus's? Orlando Brown was not good. Jawan Taylor was terrible. The interior of their line that they drafted in the second and sixth round is what saved them, Humphrey and Smith. So, like, those are the picks you got to hit on. Uh, you know, DJ, DJ brought this up about the quarterbacks, too. Once once you start making big money in this league, your weapons, they go away. Like, Tyreek yeah. Hill had to go away in Kansas City. Stephon right. Diggs just went away in Buffalo. So, it's up to Justin, like you said. Like, Justin, the hope is – he doesn't have to put the team on his back for 80% of the time, but when it's winning time and it's fourth quarter and you got to make a play – Justin Herbert, you're getting paid money to, to make a play and win a game. Um, yeah. the, the the number one option right now would be, well, guys, Joshua Palmer. Would we put yeah. Josh as our wide receiver one right now in, in oh, Los yeah. Angeles? Yeah. Absolutely. Like, I mean, he's, like, Quentin's not better than he is. Yeah. But Which Quint, is why they're not done. But they've said that. Like, every coach has said that. They're Marcus not Brady done. said it. Like, we're not done. Uh, that, that, that wide receiver room is yeah, – Whether, we're whether it's at it. five or second round or free agency, yeah, it doesn't yeah, get filled like out. that's – look, if it's Ricky Pearsall or Lad McConkey or Roman Wilson or – like, there's other players. A.D. Mitchell, Xavier Worthy to get that 4-2 speed, take the top off and just run him down the field, and now Quentin's operating under and Josh Palmer can be the Keenan Allen. Yeah, I mean, Maybe look, Darius I'd love for Davis him to get, can get a little juice on the field too. Maybe the Darius yeah. Davis can play a little offense. Remember that yeah, one game was... against the the Raiders where uh, I think he had like a sixty yard run first drive. Like they they kind of got yeah. him going. Kellen Moore got him going. Like you know, maybe he's maybe he's a piece that they can use yeah. on the offense this year. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just to kind of put a put an exclamation or put a punctuation to punctuate it. Dre Greenlaw, fifth round. Fred Warner, third round. Hufanga, fifth round. Like, those are high-level starters on a Super Bowl-caliber defense that they're getting in Debo Samuel, second round. Brandon Ayuk was a late first-rounder. So, yeah. you just got to hit. That's it. You just, you just got to hit on those picks. So, it's not about number five. It's about all nine. And really, it's about your – right now, they have two fours, so let's call it – Let's call it five picks that right now that they have. The two fours, the three, the two, and the one. Got to hit on f yeah. at least three of them. You gotta, I think you got to get four starters out of those first five picks. Like You got to find a way. Like yeah, You have to find starters. Not immediate, but by the end of the year. By the end, by of, the the year, end of the year, these are, these are players that have assimilated to the system, that are playing at a high enough level. You've developed enough to where if they're not starting, they're rotation players and they're getting significant snaps. Yeah. It's not I'm, Dayon I'm, Henley in the third, special teams only. It's significant snaps. Well, that's another guy. Like Henley's gonna have to he's gonna have to take a step this year. Like he, he's on this roster, a third round pick, man. Like we wanted to see him start last year. Like yeah. he, he's gonna have to make some hay this year. Um I, I go back, I've gone back off to this class of twenty eighteen and like when the Chargers were twelve and four, like big reason why they won was obviously Darwin's uh, an all pro his rookie season. Uh, Justin Jackson, a seventh round pick who won them the game in Pittsburgh and in Kansas right. City had a touchdown. Um, Chenna, Chenna, uh, second round pick, second round pick. Monster Justin Jones, for a second rounder. Justin Jones started in that Baltimore game yeah. the, uh, on the road wild card. Like, like that class from top to bottom contributed to the success of the team. Kaiser got Kaiser was starting at the beginning of the year yeah. before he got hurt. You know, so like that was a really good class and a, a big reason why the team was able to get to 12 and four. Obviously, you had a lot of talented veterans, but like guys made plays throughout the course of a season, a 16 game season at yeah. that time. So um, 
that's the beauty of this team is it like it's very incomplete right now but th there's going to be guys who have their name called over that weekend that are going to contribute in a huge way for this team in 2024 it's gonna be exciting to see man two weeks chris two weeks two we weeks can stop talking about it frankly two weeks frankly i wish it was one week I wish it was one week away. <laughs> yeah, not me. I'm going to be in Hawaii. So two weeks. Oh, are you going to Hawaii? I'm going to Hawaii. I mean, you should get a day. You should get a week off from the pod. Yeah, I think you're right. I'll, <laughs> I'll put in my uh, seven days right now. Put in hey. your seven days. I'll, I'll get a guest. I mean, I'd, I'd love to have you, but like, I mean, come on. Yeah, we can maybe figure it out. Maybe we can. Yeah. Maybe we can figure something out. We'll figure it'll be out. it'll be the last pod prior to the. Well, actually, no. I guess technically Thursday we'll do a pod prior, to, or maybe we'll do it on Wednesday prior to the draft. If anything wacky. Oh yeah, happens. we should probably we should probably do one that Wednesday, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, we'll do it Thursday from the from the draft party. So we'll actually do it post first round. I guess we'll figure it out. That'll be a good one. We'll figure it out. I'll see how my Aloha is feeling a week from today and whether or not I'm here. When do you get back? Sunday. We should, Sunday. Okay. Yeah, we could talk offline about this. We'll have to put exactly. It Why not? Hey, <laughs> show the people how the sausage is made. This is how we figured things out. I'm a That's terrible it. person for not giving anybody the heads up. Hey, man. We, and congratulations hey, to our man, B, and Lauren. Because uh, yeah, Greg's man. helping us out here today. Producer B, getting married. Um, happy couple. Congratulations. Happy couple. And uh, shout out to Greg Kim for holding it down for us, too. Greg, exactly Greg, right. real quick, you had, a, you had a question. Just get online and, and ask the question of money. What is it? What color do you want the third helmet to be? What color do I want the third helmet to be? Oh, boy, that's a good one. What's the right answer there? Because you know I don't like the navies. I know you don't. So we are, that, that's, I, mean, I, I, yeah. said, I said the navies just to nostalgia, you know, 90s. You know what? You know how I feel. And I know it's a very unpopular position. I want it to be royal. I want a royal blue helmet, man. Royal helmet. I want circa. I want the late. I want the late seventies, early eighties. You know, Chuck Cecil, Dan Fouts, Lance Allworth. That's what I want. I want the Royals, man. Give me. Would give you go me royal Royals. on royal, royal on royal. Well, it's it's the alternate. Uh, let me see here. Nineteen eighty. Let's go. Nineteen eighty one. Chargers uniforms. Um, yeah. See, it's royal, royal gold. That's. That's my favorite one. That that year, the Chargers, 1980s, royal helmet, royal jersey, gold pant. It was from 74 through, looks like 86. 74 through 86 had the Royals. Uh, 73, they went powder. 72, powder. 68, powder. So, yeah, there you go. You get no place from me on the royal front, man. I love the Royals. Yeah. The the Royals have a have a big fan place. of the Royals. Yeah. What do you think of that, Greg? Is that a good answer or no? Is it good, Greg? We'll let the fans decide. Well, what do you think they want? I think they want black. See, to me. I'm... All right, comment. What everybody may, does. Comment. Everybody does comment black. wherever you listen. Uh, Royal, Navy, like like throwback Navy or black. See. See, this is me, like old man, like seeing all these NBA uniforms that have nothing to do with like the the classic. Oh, the City I, Connect. Yeah, I can't, I can't stand. I'm sorry, sorry guys, if you like them. I don't like any of the like the the new NBA uniforms. Like, like you have no business. Lakers have no business not wearing like just purple and gold. Like purple I like the black model. I'll make an exception gold. there. But uh oh, like, Greg's back in. I don't know. I've seen yellow helmet mockups on Twitter as well. Yellow, that'd be kind of cool. That'd be kind of, you know, flip it, you mean? So it'd be like a, it would be like a uh, yellow top, yellow helmet with, or is it just a yellow helmet with like whites? I wonder, yeah, there's a bunch of weight. Yeah, but, yellow with the powder blue uniforms. That'd be kind of cool. I think I'd be all right so with yellow, that. yellow, I don't know. A little or Oregon do you know vibe. Do you, do you need it? Do you need a alternate helmet? Well, you get helmet? it. You get, they, they're, they're allowing an alternate helmet now. So yeah, I know, but no doubt they're going to take advantage of it. Yeah, they'll take advantage of it. Give me Royal. I'm going on. I'm going on. Uh, I'm going on. I'll plus, well, I'll can plus it, one the Royal. Yeah. I guess you could also do that old school Charger logo too, which would be kind of cool with the horse in it. 
I like I that like shield. that. Yeah, I like I like the old school logos too. I'm I'm a I'm an old school guy, buddy. I don't like this these new city connects and like some of these I MLB. Think, I, do, I, I will say though, I do like the Miami Heat ones. Uh, that's pretty cool. The the Miami, you know, the the Miami Vice vibe, Miami Heat ones are kind of cool. I'm I'm all right with that. When you can really tie in something that is a significant part of the city is yeah. kind of cool. If you can get away with that, so. All right, I'll let the heat one slide. Yeah, I didn't think but, this was going to be a long one, and and yet here we are, man. Got a lot in. You know, got a lot. Greg, in. chime in at the end. Get getting right? some good helmet questions in, and Pretty uh, awesome. You know, we got my we, masters uh, themed uh, polo on. Did you notice that the azaleas? Pretty excited oh, nice. about it. A little Travis Matthew action. Yeah, celebrating the Masters starting today. Yep. Yeah. Well, how did Tiger do? Uh, one under. Okay. How about that? All right. How guys. about that? One under. We'll take it. That, that's that's in position to make the cut. I'm all yep. right with that. Yep. I like to see Tiger play Saturday, Sunday. Absolutely. Um, all right, guys. Let's get out of here. Um, okay. For Money, I'm Chris. This has been Chargers Weekly. And for Greg Kim as well. Greg, shout out to you, brother. We'll see you next time.